I wanted to start with uh, just a simple anecdote. I have a young son that's learning to read, and like any good parent that's fed up of reading Thumper and his friends and other books like that, I decided to create an iPad app so he could uh, get new stories, keep him entertained, keep me sane. That might be a side effect. And so it's really simple. He goes in, he enters a prompt, and it gendrains a story about inane topics that are way beyond my imagination, like, real true story, uh, goats eating Nutella or little blue trucks in the forest. And as he started to use this, I learned that every time he hits that generate story button, he's using as much energy as charging your cell phone. And in fact, each one of those times he presses the generate story button, he's emitting about five grams of carbon dioxide. So that's a lot. And uh, oops, my bad. It's not on the App Store, fortunately. Uh, but this got me to think, are there opportunities that we can work together to improve the efficiency of these systems? And in fact, with AI, it's particularly dangerous because the damage is not visible to you. You press a button, somewhere in the cloud, carbon emissions are being generated. And so it's that part of AI, I think, that we need to pay particular attention to. And I think a lot of the speakers today have cited the growing environmental impact of AI, and it's gotten a lot of attention in this past year. These large models, as they're growing, are generating, are using a lot of energy and generating a lot of carbon emissions. In fact, one of the larger frontier models, if you use today, its power use is about equivalent to 20 US households at any given time. So that's just the power use of a single model running inference. And by some estimates, these data center power draws are going to go up annually about 30% a year, largely driven by model doubling times that are almost quarterly at this point. And even our day-to-day -day use of these systems is having a pretty large impact. A single chat GPT query uses nearly a bottle of water and generating an image, not using songs technology, but generating an image using some of the cloud-based technology uses as much energy as charging your phone. And I think this has been mentioned, but AI and data centers are using as much energy as a small country, and we are on track to take over some of the larger developed nations and even continents by the end of the decade. So the question really is, how do we balance the opportunities that AI gives us to improve human life without causing grave damage to the environment? And so this is for those aspiring Gen AI poop emoji developers in the audience. Please think about how this helps society or at least cut down your energy uh, use when building that application. And there's a lot of tools out there if you want to understand more about this problem, why we can't ignore it. But I'm really interested in figuring out what we can do to fix it. And the scale of AI, in my opinion, gives us a huge opportunity. So even a small change, but it being applied to billions or trillions of AI interactions a day, can have a huge global impact. And for the money-minded in the crowd, this is a unique opportunity where the economic incentives directly line up with helping the environment. And in this one situation, we can actually reduce your capex or opex while building sustainable practices. So quick question to the audience. How many of you have seen a figure like this? A few. So if you're looking to improve the energy efficiency of your home, there's figures like this to help you visualize avenues and opportunities that you may be able to use in order to improve the efficiency and reduce your environmental impact. So in that spirit, we created one to help you visualize some of the changes you could make to an AI data center in order to reduce the energy expenditure. And I think a lot of the talks today have covered many other. There's hundreds of things that you could do today. But I wanted to mention just five that we're already using and have yielded tremendous results. The first one is you really need to measure your impact. You have to know what's going on. The second is there is a good chance that you are overpowering your systems. Cut it down. The third, again, sounds quite obvious, but focus your compute budget on problems that matter and solving uh, 
parts of your AI workflow that are leading to the result. Another one, which is use smaller models where possible to achieve the same goal. And another one, which I think is more of an aspiration at this point, is how do we make our software systems themselves environmentally aware? So I'm a big believer that we need to give customers and users of Gen AI the knowledge of the environmental impact, and that will automatically drive better, more sustainable practices. For example, if I knew that every time I was generating an image for that storybook app that I was using so much carbon or emitting so much carbon, I might have thought more about how to use either a compressed model or something even more clever. And imagine if every Gen AI tool that you used out there actually told your environmental impact after using it or perhaps even while using it. And the question is, would that help you think a little bit more about how to be careful and how we use these resources? More importantly, would it make the damage itself salient and force the conversation amongst us and our service providers in order to make sure we're finding more sustainable practices? And it's this type of telemetry that, happy, that actually helped us discover probably the easiest technique that you can go home and deploy today in order to make your AI a little bit more sustainable. And this one's really, really simple. Just reduce the amount of power that you allow your processors to draw. We've seen energy reduction by 15 to 20% with small increases or decreases in performance or increases in the time taken to solve a problem and no change to the end accuracy. Beyond just the energy reduction, our processors and our data centers now run nearly 45 degrees cooler than they did before which means less cooling demand, as well as increased hardware reliability. This also means that we have lower capex and opex in order to maintain our data center, and we're able to couple this modification with other strategies or techniques in order to compound the effects significantly. For example, we could add this technique to reducing the amount of wasteful computation that we use, and we would see compounding effects of using these two techniques simultaneously. And when we look at a typical workload, and especially in training large Gen AI models, a lot of the computation goes into things that you don't actually use. So let's just take a simple example of a neural architecture search in which you're trying a bunch of different model configurations, you're going to train them to convergence, and then you're going to select a model based on performance targets such as cost or accuracy. And in many cases, you're often starting with hundreds to thousands of these models in order to essentially highlight one or two of these models that satisfy your criteria. So in this case, nearly 99% of the compute that's going into this problem isn't actually yielding a direct benefit to your end result. So what if we replace this wasteful process by a model that can sit in between and predict ahead what the converged accuracy of a particular model configuration is going to be? And so in this case, we're able to reduce the amount of compute that's going into the problem and eliminate early some of the models that are unlikely to yield you good results. We've actually applied this to a drug discovery problem and have seen some really interesting results. So in our experiments, we were able to show that our modified system could accurately predict optimal model configurations with just 20% of the computing budget. So for the environment, what this means is that we can terminate model configurations that are not likely to yield good results with just 20% of the compute energy spent. And what this means for your wallet is that you can reduce your computing demands by 50 to 80% without sacrificing the performance of that model. And one application of this may be for us to quickly discover smaller models that perform equally well as a larger model. And I know this sounds obvious, but smaller models tend to use less energy than larger models. And in many cases, especially for specialized applications or agentic systems, you can actually do quite well with a smaller model. And I love this example, which was developed by the uh, equity lab in which they built a large language model to synthesize research in climate science. They were able to fine tune a smaller model that used five to eight times less energy without compromising performance 
on their application-specific benchmark. And given that in the long run, inference tends to be a pretty large energy hog, being able to reduce that by 5 to 8x has a large, uh, has a large reduction that you'll reap the benefits with over time. And I wanted to end today uh, with work which I believe has the largest potential impact, but needs us, everyone in this room, developers and consumers, to start thinking a little bit differently. Carbon intensity varies through the day, the months, and the year. And that led us to think, can we leverage this to make our systems themselves more carbon aware? For example, can I be in energy savings mode when it's highly carbon intense outside? Or can I use larger models when I have access to renewable or low carbon energy sources? And this concept, while it's still in its early phases, has given us a glimmer of hope for where I believe we must go if we're going to be serious about mitigating the environmental risk of AI. So to test this, we made a simple experiment. We told the system that if it's highly carbon intense, use a smaller model because we know they use less energy. At times where I have access to renewable resources, do whatever you think is best. And we got some really exciting results out of this. In the case of a computer vision model, we were able to reduce carbon emissions by nearly 80% over a 48-hour period with a very small 2 to 3% reduction in the object detection capabilities. In the case of a generative AI application, where we told the system to constrain answers based on real-time carbon emissions, we were able to again reduce carbon emissions over the same time period by about 80% with no change in performance as measured by a variety of popular benchmarks. And so I'm really hoping we start to design our systems around this idea, and I think that there are major opportunities. Because I don't know about you, but if I had a technique like this available, and I could make my storybook app use a slightly small, lesser quality image, I would be more than happy to take that if it meant that I could help the environment while doing it. 